Walters Sports Bar is available for private events. Visit waltersdc.com slash private events for more information. We're driven by the search for better. But when it comes to hiring, the best way to search for a candidate isn't to search at all. Don't search match with Indeed. Indeed is your matching and hiring platform with over 350 million global monthly visitors, according to Indeed data, and a matching engine that helps you find quality candidates fast. Ditch the busy work. Use Indeed for scheduling, screening, and messaging so you can connect with candidates faster. Leveraging over 140 million qualifications and preferences every day, Indeed's matching engine is constantly learning from your preferences, so the more you use Indeed, the better it gets. Join more than 3.5 million businesses worldwide that use Indeed to hire great talent fast. And listeners of this show will get a $75 sponsored job credit to get your jobs more visibility at Indeed.com slash BlueWire. Just go to Indeed.com slash BlueWire right now and support our show by saying that you heard about Indeed on this podcast. That's Indeed.com slash BlueWire. Terms and conditions apply. Need to hire? You need Indeed. Another 3 2. So we had a looping line drive into right. That's going to dunk in for a base hit. It'll bring in Schneider, and the Blue Jays lead it 6 to 1. First pitch. So we had a line drive center field. That's a base hit. Rosario scores. Young on his heels. He'll score. And this is now a two run game. Garcia drives in two. It's the Blue Jays six, the Nationals four. The hold for Cabrera. The 2 0 pitch to Garcia. So we had a fly ball left center field. This is getting down. It's going to be a base hit, and we'll tie the game. So we had a fly ball, right center field and deep. This one's way back. It's got a chance. It's going, and it's gone. Eddie Rosario did it. His biggest hit as a National is a two-run homer. And the Nationals are back in front, 10 to eight. Number two for Eddie. What a huge hit that is for him. And welcome to Nats Chat for Monday, May 6, 2024. What is the Nationals' first off day since April 22nd? And boy, <laughs> have they earned it. Along with MadisonSports.com, Nationals insider Mark Zuckerman, who is at Nationals Park. I'm Al Galdi, host of the Al Galdi podcast. The Nats now have won seven of their last 10 games. The Nats, for this 2024 regular season, now are back at 500, 17 and 17. And the Nats just authored a wild win, an 11 8 win over the Toronto Blue Jays at Nationals Park on Sunday to win the series two games to one. This was a game for which the start was delayed for 85 minutes due to rain. This was a game in which the Nats overcame a 6 1 third inning deficit. This was a game in which the Nats and Blue Jays combined for 19 runs, 21 hits, 5 errors, and 12 pitchers used. Heck, the Nats, through 5 innings, had used four pitchers. The Nats scored at least one run in six of the eight innings in which the team batted, including scoring five runs in the bottom of the fourth. If you would like to sponsor the Nats Chat Podcast, for which there is a new episode for the morning after every Nats game day, email Tim Shovers at Nats Chat Podcast at gmail.com. We'd love to have you on board. Mark, what a game this was. What a win this was for the Nats. It was an absurd baseball game, Al, and I mean that in the most complimentary way. Sometimes you need a game like this to just remind you how much fun it can be. And I know if they had lost the game, we wouldn't be talking about how much fun it was, but they did win it. And so let's talk about it. So much going on. As I wrote in my story, like this team is flawed in a lot of ways. Okay. We know the lineup has some big holes in it. We know the pitching can be erratic day to day. Their defense the last two days was just awful which has not necessarily been the case all year long, but it was certainly for these two. And yet you take a step back and say they are once again a 500 baseball team and they have now pulled off 12 come from behind wins out of their 17 wins this year. And that's the most in the major leagues. And so while the path to get there isn't always the smoothest and in a perfect world, if you're truly a contending team, that's not the way you want to have to go about it. But they do have this ability and we're you know not quite a quarter of the way into the season. We're almost there. I think this team is developing an identity, and as Davey has used the term more than once, they're relentless. And even when they're down early, even when you get a bad start out of Mackenzie Gore, it's not over. And the more you do this, the more you think in those terms, and those guys don't give up, even if they're down five, six, even seven runs like they were a week ago. So 
I don't know what it means long term if this is the way they're going to play all year long, but it is fun to watch right now. And it's the kind of thing that we have not seen here in a while. Well, and this is the kind of game that in 2022 and 2023 almost certainly would have been like a 9-1, 12-2 kind of loss. Nats were down 6-1 in the third inning, and that was basically tap-out time these last two seasons. Not necessarily because the Nats quit, but just because they did not have the offensive prowess to come back. They did not have the talent, let's be honest, to come back. Now things are a bit different. Like you said, it's not a a totally clean firing on all cylinders operation, but this is a much more respectable professional baseball team as compared to these last few seasons. And we're seeing that here as evidenced by that 500 record now a month plus into the regular season. So, so many ways that you can break this game down. I think you start with this. Three major offensive heroes for the Nats in this game on Sunday. Luis Garcia Jr., Jesse Winker, and Eddie Rosario, Luis Garcia Jr., in a season that is offering multiple individual bright spots from a standpoint of guys asserting themselves as true building blocks in the rebuild. How about what Garcia is doing? Remember back in spring training, the conversation was he may not even be the everyday second baseman anymore. Trey Lipscomb may have supplanted Garcia in that spot. Well, (laughs) Luis Garcia said, not so fast, my friend. Garcia on Sunday as the Nats starting second baseman and number three batter, four for four with a solo homer, a two-run single, an RBI single, and another single, and he had a stolen base. Now, he in the bottom of the eighth was pinch hit for by Eldemaro Vargas uh, due to Garcia having jammed a wrist, but uh, as Mark noted on X after the game, doesn't appear that this is a big deal. But Garcia in this game, an absolute force. He and the Nats, one run first, had a one-out single through the right side of the infield on an 0-2 pitch, and he had to steal a second base. Garcia in the Nats, one run third, a one-out solo homer to right center field to cut the Nats' deficit to 6-2. Garcia in an Nats five-run fourth, a two-out first pitch, a two-run single to center field to cut the Nats' deficit to 6-4. Garcia in the Nats one-run sixth, a game-tying one-out opposite field RBI single to left center field to tie the game at eight. He was thrown out in an attempt to stretch the single into a double. So he did all of that. And keep in mind what he did Elsewhere in this series, the 6-3 loss to the Blue Jays on Saturday, Garcia in that game, two for four, RBI single, another single, and a walk, did commit a fielding error. But Garcia in the 9-3 win on Friday evening came off the bench, three-run homer and a walk. He had an at's four-run seventh in that game, a pinch First pitch, three-run homer to center field. And he in the Nats, four-run eighth on Friday evening, drew a one-out walk. This guy is playing like an all-star. His slash line for this regular season now, batting average 337, on base percentage 381, slugging percentage of 510. I thought it was so interesting the way that Davey Martinez in his post-game presser with you guys on Sunday evening talked about Garcia when asked about him. I've had him now for four years, and there was, there's always, I've always said there's something in there, right? I mean, I just got to figure, you know, how to figure out how to get it out of him, get him to understand, you know, what we're trying to do, what he's trying to do. And- Talking about sort of the process of trying to get what he can out of Garcia, but he said there's something there. There is something there, and we're seeing that something. We've always known there's something there. From the moment he came up at age 20, you could tell there is definitely something there. But as Davey was describing, it's how do you bring that out of him? And it's interesting because not every player is the same. Different guys respond to different types of motivation. Different guys need to be pushed in different ways. And you saw last year, they tried to send him a message by demoting him to AAA and they said, you know, go work on your focus, on your preparation. It wasn't even so much just about the results. It was about how he was going about being a ball player on a daily basis. Then you have this spring and Davey acknowledged like, he was hard on Luis, harder than almost anybody else. And, you know, at times it made you wonder, like, have they given up on him? Do they just not believe in this guy? And I think we're learning a little bit more now that there was maybe a little bit of tough love there, that it, there was a calculated effort to try to say to him, you know what, you've got a lot of skill, but you have not shown us that you can do this on a consistent basis at the big league level. And we're now expecting that from you. And if it doesn't happen, We've got some kids in the pipeline who could supplant you. So you better start showing us that you can avoid those kind of mistakes, those lapses that we'd seen from him in the past. And so it's been such a pleasure to watch that development from him from where he was in March (laughs) to where he is now in early May. It's incredible. And it's not just at the plate. He's been outstanding in the field as well. 
There have been some really nice double plays or near double plays he's been a part of that he's turned. He's getting to balls that I don't think we've seen him get to in the past, going to his left especially. It has just been a joy to watch this, and it's just a good reminder to everyone that everyone develops their own pace, and sometimes different guys need different types of coaching and motivation. It's not one size fits all. So I'm going to give Davey and the organization here a lot of credit for the way they've handled this and the way they have pushed Luis Garcia to now get the most out of him. And he's loving it. He is playing the best baseball of his career, and it's been such a pleasure to watch. This is player development. This is what we have been screaming for. This is what we have been yearning for for years now. This is what got the Nats into this predicament to begin with, not properly developing guys. Let's be honest, guys getting worse under the Nats watch, not better. Here's a guy who the Nats are taking and are making better. This is so encouraging. And, you know, something with Luis Garcia Jr., this is his fifth season in which he has played in the majors. It's only his age 24 season. He's a young guy, you know, so if he's a late bloomer, That's actually okay because he's still in just his mid-20s. There is a lot of baseball potentially left in his career. Hey guys, it's Al Galdi for Window Nation, which has another great deal for listeners of the Nats Chat Podcast. 50% off all window styles plus 0% interest for five years and an additional bonus if you schedule an appointment this week. This offer is good throughout This month of May, Window Nation windows are the best. Increase the value, look, and feel of your home. Call 866-90NATION or visit windownation.com and tell Window Nation that you want the deal that you heard about from Al Galdi on the Nats Chat Podcast. Window Nation can install your new windows in a day or less. Window Nation's windows come with a lifetime warranty. Get a free, no-obligation quote now. Call 866-90NATION or visit windownation.com. That's 866-90-NATION or windownation.com and tell Window Nation that Al Galdi sent you. We're driven by the search for better. But when it comes to hiring, the best way to search for a candidate isn't to search at all. Don't search match with Indeed. Indeed is your matching and hiring platform with over 350 million global monthly visitors, according to Indeed data, and a matching engine that helps you find quality candidates fast. Ditch the busy work. Use Indeed for scheduling, screening, and messaging so you can connect with candidates faster. Leveraging over 140 million qualifications and preferences every day, Indeed's matching engine is constantly learning from your preferences, so the more you use Indeed, the better it gets. Join more than 3.5 million businesses worldwide that use Indeed to hire great talent fast. And listeners of this show will get a $75 sponsored job credit to get your jobs more visibility at Indeed.com slash BlueWire. Just go to Indeed.com slash BlueWire right now and support our show by saying that you heard about Indeed on this podcast. That's Indeed.com slash BlueWire. Terms and conditions apply. Need to hire? You need Indeed. Here's your Dylan Cruz and James Wood updates for the games played on Sunday in Harrisburg. 6-2 loss to the Altoona Curve. Cruz hit third. He went 0 for 2, drew an RBI walk. He's hitting 230 on the season with an OPS of 730. Up to AAA where the Rochester Red Wings defeated the Syracuse Mets 6-1. James Wood went 1 for 3. He also drew a walk. Scored a run. He's hitting 325 on the year with an OPS of 895. And oh, by the way, Victor Robles was the DH in this game. One for three, scored two runs. Now back to the show. Here's the pitch on the way. Swing a fly ball. Deep right center field. Springer going back, looking up. It's gone. It's gone. And the Nationals lead. Jesse Winker's three-run homer makes it 7-6. to six. He dropped his bat, he stared in the dugout, and said, get on my back, boys. We're in front. Home run number four for Winker. A three-run shot at 7-6. to six. What an inning. Jesse Winker, he on Sunday as an ad starting left fielder and number five batter, got on base five times. Two for two with a three-run homer, a double, a walk, an intentional walk. And a hit by pitch. A winker in the Nats, one run first, a two out walk. Bottom of the third, a two out full count hit by pitch, despite having been down at 1.02. Winker in the Nats, five run fourth, a two out full count 
three-run homer to right field for a 7-6 Nats lead to complete the Nats' comeback from a 6-1 third-inning deficit. Normally, you use a phrase like that for something that happens late in a ball game. Here we are in the fourth inning, and the Nats have overcome a 6-1 third-inning deficit. I mean, this game was insane. <laughs> Winker in the Nats, two-run seventh, a leadoff first pitch, opposite field double to left field, and Winker in the Nats, one-run eighth, a one-out intentional walk. We know the deal with Jesse Winker, got off to a hot start, has since cooled off, but man, a big game for him on Sunday. Good to see him be able to bounce back from having had that rough stretch where you wondered, okay, was that it? Was that lightning in a bottle and and they can't hold on to that for any longer? So that was good to see. And what I'm also appreciating about Jesse Winker, here's a guy who he came to spring training on a minor league deal. He had a couple of bad years in Milwaukee and Seattle, and there was some talk of him not being great in the clubhouse and having issues with teammates. That was the reputation coming in. He comes to spring training and he's kind of soft-spoken and sort of trying to mind his P's and Q's, not make any waves. And now what you've seen as he's gotten to know them and as he started to play well and take on a big role on the team, the personality is coming out. And this is a guy who loves to express himself out on the field with his teammates. You see him being really encouraging of his teammates when they make good plays. And when he hit that home run, as he's jogging down to first base, he kind of stops and looks at the dugout. He told us he was looking at C.J. Abrams and Lane Thomas because I guess they had been having some conversations lately about the way things are going. And there was some kind of moment there between them. What I've been impressed with is that Winker is not just happy with the way he's playing. He's really enjoying how everyone else is doing and being a part of this team that is starting to develop this identity. Very good to see. And uh, Jesse Winker, even with the recent slumping, his OPS for this regular season, a uh, more than respectable 793. And then there is Eddie Rosario. And isn't baseball a funny thing? Eddie Rosario had not had a single hit in a game at Nationals Park this regular season until he got an infield single on Saturday. We had some fun with that on the last installment of this podcast. Well, perhaps the infield single heard around the world <laughs> on Saturday has gotten Eddie Rosario going. He on Sunday as your Nat starting right fielder and number eight batter, two for four with a two-run homer and a single. Yes, I said Rosario homered on Sunday. He and the Nats five run fourth had a leadoff single to center field, and he and the Nats a two run seventh, a tie breaking two out, two run homer to right field for a 10 8 Nats lead. The homer went a projected 402 feet per stat cast. Look, he had been struggling. Maybe he still is struggling. Who knows? But this guy isn't this bad. I mean, he was struggling to a degree that really seemed absurd. Like, he has had success in his career. He as recently as last season was actually a pretty decent hitter. So you figured, okay, he's going to do more than what he has done. And perhaps, hopefully, we're finally starting to see that here. Yeah, of course. And it's funny how this works. It seems like it's always this way. You're in a big slump. You don't break out of it with a, a home run. You break out of it with a little nubber <laughs> that you beat out or a blooper, something kind of fluky like that, and it just takes the pressure off and you feel good about yourself again. I'll tell you what, it was the at-bat prior to that, the line drive single, two at-bats prior to that actually, line drive single to center, really good contact and I think a good sign, and that maybe in his mind allowed him to start thinking more in terms of driving the ball again, something that he has not been doing, obviously. So when he does come up in that spot and he's facing a good reliever in Swanson and he crushed that pitch. You could see the rush of emotion from him, and you could see it from his teammates. And again, these are the things I'm talking about, a team starting to come together. There are players on a Nationals team that could look at Eddie Rosario and say, we don't need this guy. He's done. He's 0 for his last 31. He's taken that bats away from others. Why are we sticking with him? That's not what the case is here. You saw both in this sort of humorous reaction to his first hit on Saturday, and then the reaction to the home run on Sunday, that they care about him, that they've wanted to will him through this, knowing, like you just said, he's a much better player than this. This is a guy with a significant track record of success and for delivering in big moments in his career. So you could see the joy in their faces at him having success again. I don't know, like you said, does this mean that he's suddenly going to turn into the Eddie Rosario? They hope they were going to get all along. I'm not going there yet, but it is in there somewhere and it's got to start from something. And maybe in these last two days, we're starting to see it now come together. Your bottom line, the Nats offense on Sunday, 11 runs on 11 hits and five walks. I noted this on the last installment of the podcast. The Nats are so much better this season at drawing walks 
The Nats ended up drawing five walks exactly in each game in this series. And you look at the 11 hits, three home runs, three doubles to go with five singles. The Nats went four for 13 with runners in scoring position. And the Nats in this series torched that Toronto bullpen. The Blue Jays bullpen is not good. The numbers for this season for that Blue Jays bullpen are wretched. But props to the Nats for really capitalizing on what is a really bad Blue Jays bullpen. The Nats really in all three games in this series inflicted damage on that Toronto bullpen. And it's why you felt like once you got to like the fifth inning that they were more in control of things, especially because the back of their own bullpen has been so good and you trust them now to close these games out. But think back just a couple days ago, we're in Texas. We're talking about this lineup can't do anything. They went two games without drawing a walk down there. And you're thinking, okay, is this just going to be the continuation of this? And maybe that Marlins series was the anomaly. Well, I think we're we're still in this, like, not entirely sure what to make of all this. They're having success against some bad teams. And I guess we call the Blue Jays bad right now, even though they're supposed to be good, but they're not playing well. They really struggled against the defending World Series champs. Maybe that says more about the Rangers than anything else. Like I said, this is a flawed team. They're not perfect. But they have shown an ability now to hit when they have the right matchups, to not give up even when they're down early. And I think in the bigger picture here, it's something to watch for. When they're in a game late and it's close, I feel like they have the advantage most nights. Something that you said earlier about the difference between this team in the last few years when this would have just turned into a, you know, a loss that they never really had a chance. They probably would have on a few occasions battled. You know, they would have brought the tying run to the plate because that's what they always did. The boys would battle, but they never finished it off. Or maybe they would come back, but then the bullpen would blow it at the back end of it and it'd be wasted. And I think that's the difference now of this team. They have the talent. They have the ability to come back and, and finish those. And then also, I think the confidence in their bullpen and their ability to score runs late that when they do get to the seventh, eighth inning and it's a close game, they feel like they should win it every time. It took a while, but spring slash summer is finally here in the DMV, I think, which means plenty of chances to comfortably go to the ballpark. The first place Orioles come to town, and it's time to check the game time app for plenty of ticketing options. Make sure to look at their all-in pricing. Toggling this feature shows the total up front with no surprise fees at checkout. Game time offers the lowest price guarantee, or game time will credit you 110% of the difference. Take the guesswork out of buying MLB tickets with GameTime. Download the GameTime app, create an account, and use code NATSCHAT for $20 off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create an account and redeem code NATSCHAT for $20 off. Download GameTime today. Last minute tickets, lowest price, guaranteed. Football season may be over, but the action on the floor is heating up. Whether it's tournament season or the fight for the playoff home court, there's no shortage of high-stakes basketball moments this time of year. Get in on the excitement with Prize Picks, America's number one fantasy sports app where you can turn your hoops knowledge into serious cash. You can now win up to 100 times your money on Prize Picks with as little as four correct picks. You can turn $10 into $1,000 with NBA, NHL, and college basketball entries today on Prize Picks. Prize Picks even offers injury insurance so that your entries stay in play even if one of your players gets injured. So for basketball games, this means if you have a player who exits the game in the first half and doesn't return in the second, that player projection won't count against you and the rest of your entry stays live. Download the app today and use the code BLUEWIRE for a first deposit match up to $100. That code is BLUEWIRE for a first deposit match of up to $100. Prize picks. Pick more, pick less. It's that easy. And now the pitch. Swing and a high drive, deep left field, way back, going, going. And this ball is gone. A changeup, thigh high left over the middle of the plate, and Vladimir Guerrero Jr. has snapped his home run drought that had reached 21 games back to April 10th. And the Blue Jays have turned this into a big inning. Guerrero Jr. just now trotting down the line from third to touch home plate. Five runs home in the inning, two errors in the inning, and the Blue Jays lead it 5-1. to one. 
Well, as is almost always the case in a come-from-behind win, the pitching ends up playing a role. And the Nats' bullpen in this 11-8 win over the Blue Jays on Sunday was key. Six Nats relievers combined to allow two runs, one earned in six innings. Jacob Barnes tossed a scoreless top of the fourth. Jordan Weems was charged with two runs, one earned in a third of an inning. He and what ended up being a two-run Blue Jays fifth faced three batters, but got just one out. Derek Law in what ended up being that two-run Blue Jays fifth faced three batters and got two outs. Dylan Floro tossed one and two-thirds scoreless innings despite giving up a double and a single and issuing a walk. Hunter Harvey was terrific, one and a third scoreless and hitless innings. And Kyle Finnegan, a scoreless and hitless top of the ninth for the save. Nats relievers over the three games in this series. We just talked about how bad the Blue Jays bullpen was. Four runs, three earned in 13 innings. Not bad at all. So you look at the Nats bullpen on Sunday, some really good work. But also some really aggressive usage by Davey Martinez. If you didn't know better, you would have thought that this was Game 7 of the World Series. Now, the Nats have a couple of off days coming up over the next four days, so Davey could afford to be aggressive. But man, six Nats relievers used in this game. Like I mentioned earlier, by the time we got through five innings, the Nats had used four pitchers in this game. Yeah, I was going to say it reminded me of the way he would manage some of those playoff games or maybe September pennant race games where... They could have tried to squeeze another inning out of Mackenzie Gore. I know he was struggling. The pitch count was really high, but he was at 76. You could try and say, listen, we need to save the bullpen some. But no, he makes the move. And then it's not, okay, we're going to go to our long man, not that they really have one, or at least try to get a couple innings out of the first guy. He gets a scoreless inning out of Jacob Barnes on 11 pitches and then goes right to Jordan Weems after that and then doesn't even let Weems finish an inning before he goes to Derek Law to get through that one. So ultra aggressive managing, but he admitted that knowing they had the day off on Monday, that's a big part of it. You have that luxury that you can now be a bit more aggressive with it. And as we said, I think you're realizing that if you can just get to like the seventh inning with this bullpen, they're in pretty good shape most of the time. Dylan Floro has become a real weapon for them like they hoped he would. He is a guy with a track record. And the Harvey Finnegan combo has been outstanding. Finnegan walked the leadoff batter in this game. That was only his second base runner in like his last eight games that he's pitched. He's now 11 out of 12 in save opportunities. Harvey is consistently giving them more than three outs when they need it. It's really been impressive to watch this. And I, again, I believe it gives them an advantage now late in games. I think they are the better team most of the time. If it's close by the time you get to the seventh, eighth inning, I think the Nationals have the advantage. So the Nets offense on Sunday, major positive. The Nats bullpen on Sunday, major positive. But unfortunately, there were a few negatives in this game, and those negatives were the starting pitcher, Mackenzie Gore, and the Nats defense. The Nats, over the final two games of this series, committed seven errors, four errors on Saturday, three more errors on Sunday. Uh, And this does tie in to what happened with Mackenzie Gore. So Gore in this game on Sunday, six runs, two earned in three innings. This was a blow-up start for Mackenzie Gore. He gave up six hits, which were a grand slam, a double, and four singles. He issued two walks. He did record four strikeouts. He did throw a good number of strikes, 76 pitches, 50 strikes versus just 26 balls. But this was a rough outing. Top of the second, he allowed five runs, though only one of them was earned. The inning featured two Nats errors, a one-out throwing error by catcher Kbert Ruiz on a Dalton Varsho steal of second base. Uh, Kbert's throw was way high. uh, And we had a one-out fielding error by Gore himself, allowing Varsho to score to tie the game at one as Gore butchered the fielding of a grounder off the bat of Isaiah Kiner Falefa. So Gore was very much plagued by bad defense. Let's make that clear. But some of the defense that was bad came from Gore himself. But also in this inning was Gore not pitching well. I mean, he gave up a mammoth grand slam by Vladimir Guerrero Jr. This was the biggest moment of the inning. A bomb to left field for a 5-1 Blue Jays lead. The homer went a projected 416 feet per stat cast. Gore in that Blue Jays five-run second gave up the grand slam and two singles, issued two walks, threw an astounding 44 pitches. In one inning, Gore threw 44 pitches And he then allowed a run in the top of the third. And then that was it. Davey Martinez yanked Gore from the game. And then we did get a third Nats error in the game. Uh, This came during the Blue Jays' two-run fifth. Reliever Derek Law was pitching. He faced three batters, got two outs. The one out that he did not get was due to a run-scoring fielding error by shortstop C.J. Abrams as Abrams with a runner on third, two outs. And the game tied at seven, allowed a one-hop grounder to get by him 
to give the Blue Jays an 8-7 lead. Abrams earlier in that inning had actually made a terrific diving catch of a grounder. So you have Gore and you have the defense. Two different topics, but two subjects that clearly were tied together on Sunday. Yeah, right. And if they make some of those plays, including Gore himself, maybe it never gets to Guerrero in the Grand Slam, but it did get there and he still made what was really a bad pitch, a changeup that was waist high that was clobbered by Guerrero. So this was not a good outing by Gore. He admitted it, first admitted it. The play that he didn't make there was a classic case of it's first and third, little dribbler. He charges in and he's already thinking, he's looking up, okay, I got the out at the plate. He didn't secure the ball before he had that. And it's a wet ball, wet field, all that probably had something to do with it. Then once he realizes I don't have the out at the plate, well, at least he still has the out at first, except he looked up again before he had the ball in his hand. And so now everybody's safe and a wasted opportunity there. So he's got to be better. And he acknowledged it. He knows that the 44 pitches is what got me. I mean, they actually had the bullpen up and going that inning. He may have been one batter away from being pulled because you approach 50 pitches in one inning. I don't care who you are. That's getting into high danger territory. And I'm sure Davey was nervous about that. Now, he let him come back for the next one. Maybe a clean third. They let him come back for the fourth. But because that one wasn't so great either, even at 76 pitches, I understand why you pull the plug and don't take any chances. So, you know, we're still seeing this development of Mackenzie Gore where you hope that those blow-up starts don't happen as frequently. They are still happening. It's been one or two of them so far this year. He's been good at times at when he's not at his best at still grinding through it and ending up only giving up one or two runs. This wasn't that. He's got to shake this one off and come back the next time and be better. You know, you'd love for that development to happen where he devoids these. But on this day, it was just one of those starts by him. Yeah. And I think that that is one of the big hurdles that not only Gore, but also Josiah Gray needs to get over. And that is you got to avoid these blow up starts. Uh, your colleague at Masson, Jim Palmer, has talked about this many times, but avoid the big inning, you know, and make it a one or two run inning, not a four or five run inning. And you, you cannot have what happened in that second inning on Sunday. You cannot give up that grand slam. I don't care what is happening behind you defensively. Like you can't do that. You, you know, it's just not allowed. That's not permissible. And yet that went down. So that I, I think is a big part of the evolution here of guys like Gore and Gray is avoiding these outings in which, you know, you don't last for long and you give up a bunch of runs. I think if you get to that point, you're actually in a pretty good place. But, you know, there is a high variance, it feels like, with Mackenzie Gore. Sometimes he's great, but he's still capable of having these outings that are quite bad. I mean, this is going to sound odd, but go back to game one of this series. Patrick Corbin gets hurt early in the game, gets hurt in terms of giving up runs, ends up lasting for six innings, three runs in six innings. You know, not that Patrick Corbin is a model for being an ace, but I give him credit for that. And that's the kind of thing that I want to see more of from guys like Gore and Gray. And Gore could have done that in this game, and he didn't do that. And Corbin did do that. And I think there's a real difference there that uh, certainly Gore should take note of. I was just thinking the exact same thing, that for all his faults, I think Corbin has gotten better at not letting that start completely spiral out of control on him. Even the game in Miami, where he gave up the seven early runs, he made it through, what, the fourth, I think, before they finally pulled it. He put up a couple of zeros after the big disaster to get started on the day. And so, not that Mackenzie Gore needs to try to be more like Patrick Corbin in most ways. Of course not. But there is something to be learned from that. And it comes with experience. You learn how to pitch. You learn how to shrug off when bad things happen behind you or when you're even responsible yourself like he was for that one error and how when you get to that spot, now all of a sudden the bases are loaded and the big slugger's at the plate, how to make sure you don't give up that big blast. You mentioned Jim Palmer. He's the guy who never gave up a grand slam in his career, right? There's nobody better to talk about avoiding the blow up than the great Jim Palmer. As for the defense, so I don't want to make too big of a deal out of two games, especially two games for which the weather was not good. But man, it does stand out. The Nats over their first 33 games of this regular season charged with just 10 errors. The Nats over the final two games of this series charged with seven errors. I do think that that is a representation of how errors are not a good way to judge defense. We've mentioned this. The advanced metrics are not kind to the Nats defense this season. So if you're following those, things like defensive runs saved, you're maybe not stunned by the Nats struggling defensively these last two games. I don't know. How much stock do you put into the bad defense these last two days? I feel like I don't want to go too nuts with it, but it wasn't good. I mean, it, it was pretty bad to see some of this defense. Yeah, it was. Now, I think for the most part, I know you talked about this yesterday, but you know, the eye test suggests that they've played better defense. Maybe not great defense, but better. And I, I agree with that, actually. I know what the metrics say. If you dig a little deeper, it kind of 
boils down to a few positions. I think in particular, right field has been bad for them. Catcher and pitcher have actually been bad for them from a defensive standpoint. First base has been very good. Shortstop Abrams has been good. Center field, I think, has been good for them. So I think with that stuff, sometimes you have to wait a little longer and and see how it all comes together in the long run. But I do think the errors in this case, it was maybe like a little correction there. We've saw over much of the first month of the year, Joey Gallo saving errors from his infield teammates. But Lipscomb was making, you know, was bouncing throws that were being uh, stopped in particular. Abrams wasn't perfect. Garcia wasn't perfect. And now you're seeing some of those throws are not being scooped without Gallo at first base. So I think that maybe have something to do with it as well. And then you just have the fluky plays like the one that Gore had in this game. You know, what are you going to say? It, it, it happens. Abrams, you know, dropping a, a line drive. I mean, it's going to happen every once in a while. I think it's only his second error of the season. So I don't want to read too much into it. It's probably a case of the defense maybe wasn't as good as we thought it was coming into this, but it's also not as bad as we saw the last two days. They are better than that, and I think they know that. Well, next up for the Nats uh, after their off day on Monday is a two-game series against the American League leading Orioles at Nationals Park, our first installment of the Battle of the Beltways in this uh, 2024 season. Game one, Tuesday evening at 645. Trevor Williams will be the Nats starting pitcher, and the Orioles starting pitcher will be their ace, Corbin Burns. A battle of the aces on Tuesday evening. Trevor Williams and Corbin Burns. And then uh, game two, Wednesday evening, 645. Mitchell Parker for the Nats and uh, Kyle Bradish for the O's. So going to be a very interesting series for all of the reasons that uh, we always know. The O's, like the Nats, scored 11 runs on Sunday. The O's uh, won at the Cincinnati Reds 11-0 to complete a three-game sweep. We saw the O's have their way with the Nats last season, but the Nats are a better team this season. These first two games will be at Nationals Park, uh, although we know that the Nats have actually been better on the road this season. But, you know, looking at the standings right now, and this is crazy to think about. So I mentioned the O's having the best record in the American League. If you look at the overall National League standings, the Nats have the sixth best record in the NL right now at 17 and 17. The Nats are a respectable team right now. This is really good to see. If the season ended today, they'd be in the playoffs, right? It doesn't end today. Unfortunately, there's a long way to go still, uh, but we will see. But I want to see how they stack up against what's obviously a very good Orioles team. I think we've started to learn a little bit about the Nats here in the first month plus. They've clearly been superior to some bad teams. They handled the Dodgers well in LA, we know, then got swept by them back at home. They struggled to hit certainly against the Rangers. They're facing a pretty tough pitching here in this series. How does this lineup handle that? I would guess we're going to be talking more about them struggling. They're going to have to come through in some situations. They've got to get Caber Ruiz going. He's been awful here lately. Joey Manessis started to have some better at-bats, but they need more out of him. And then you hope that Abrams and Garcia and Winker can keep up what they're doing. But it'll be fun. It's a home series, but you know there's going to be a lot of Oriole fans. That's the way it is still around here. I'll be interested to see how do they stack up against them. Do they put on a good show and kind of let everybody in the region recognize that while Baltimore is clearly the better team right now and is built to be really good for a long time, are the Nats closing that gap? Are they getting closer now to a point where we're talking about a two playoff contending region here like we had for a while in the mid-2010s? Uh, Would love to have that again. What we had in 2014 was sensational with each team winning its division like that and each team clinching on the same night. And I'll never forget it on Masson and on Masson 2, we had dueling champagne clubhouse celebrations. That to me is a real high point for baseball in the Washington, D.C. area since we got the Nats in town. Having those two teams, I know a lot of Nats fans hate the O's and if you do, that's fine. But if you're like me, you grew up with nothing but the O's to see those two teams on that night in 2014 each celebrating a division championship was so cool to see. Yeah, and there was legitimate talk going into that October of a Beltway World Series. The Orioles got to the uh, ALCS. The Nats, of course, blew their series against the Giants, so it never happened. I mean, a long way to go for anything like that could be reality again. But the Orioles have shown the blueprint of how to do it. (laughs) Now, theirs was maybe a little more extreme. They were really, really bad for several years and have gotten really, really good with some incredible draft and player development. The Nats have taken a bit different approach, but they're also trying to make it back, I think, a little quicker than the Orioles did with their rebuild. You tell us what you think. Hit us up on x at Nats underscore chat. You can email the show Nats Chat Podcast 
at gmail.com. You can find us on YouTube. Just search Nats Chat. Our YouTube handle is at Nats Chat Podcast. You can check out our website, NatsChatPodcast.com, at which you can buy a Nats Chat Podcast t-shirt. All Nationals radio highlights on Nats Chat are courtesy of 106.7 The Fan. For Mark Zuckerman, I'm Al Galdi. Thank you for listening, and we'll talk to you next time on the Nats Chat Podcast. 3-1. Launched in the air to right center field and deep. Back on this one, Springer to the warning track. Looking up at the wall, and it is gone. Luis Garcia puts it over the big wall in right center field, about five rows in. And Garcia continues to swing a hot bat. That's his third homer of the season, his second of the series. It's now Toronto six and the Nationals two. Whether you're a world-class athlete or a podcaster like me, we all understand the importance of mental and physical well-being and proper recovery for top-notch performance. That's why I'm excited that Unified Healing is sponsoring this podcast. Unified Healing is a new and super innovative global network of wellness centers powered by Energy Enhancement System, or EE System. If you haven't heard of the EE System, you'll want to listen up. This technology promotes wellness, deep relaxation, purification, and rejuvenation. At hundreds of locations across the globe, access to a center is easy and affordable. Interested in experiencing the EE system technology for yourself? Go to unifiedhealing.com slash bluewire to learn more and find a center near you. That's U-N-I-F-Y-D healing.com slash bluewire. No material or testimonials on the Unified Healing website are intended to be viewed as medical advice or a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. Always seek the advice of your physician or other qualified healthcare provider with any questions you may have regarding a medical condition or treatment and before undertaking a new healthcare regimen, including EE system.